Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Samvad Talk series organized by IIIT Bangalore. Continuing on our current theme of education and technology, today's Samvad Talk title, Questions, A Window into Children's Minds, shall be delivered by Professor Jayashree. We are indeed honored to have Professor Jayashree with us today for sharing some of her valuable thoughts. Today's session will be chaired by Professor Jaya Srivalsan Nair. Professor Nair obtained her PhD in computer science from the University of California, Davis, after having completed her BTEC in aerospace engineering from IIT Madras and an MS in computational engineering from Mississippi State University. Professor Jaya wears many hats at IIIT Bangalore. She is currently working as an associate professor, is the warden of the girls' hostel and also the coordinator of Samvad Talk series. She leads the Graphics visual Visualization Computing Lab at IIITB and is the core team member of the eHealth Research Center. So over to you, Professor Jaya. Thank you, Amrita. Um, yeah, so we are very grateful for having Professor Jayashri Ramdas with us today. Um, I guess the audience will start trickling in, so I'll just quickly introduce uh, Professor to you all. Um, Professor Jayashri Ramdas uh, was until 2019 a faculty member at the TIFR, that's the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research Center for Interdisciplinary Sciences, Hyderabad. Prior to that, for 40 years, she was at uh, the Homi Baba Center for Science Education, TIFR, Mumbai, where she served as the center director between 2011 and uh, 2016. Her research and developmental work has been in cognitive aspects of uh, science learning, including students' conceptions, uh, visuospatial reasoning, development and evaluation of elementary science curricula, and teacher professional development. Um, so um, I think she is probably one of the very few who work on science education in the country itself, and she's paved a new path uh, of research and uh, uh, development in the country in this particular uh, topic. Uh, so today's talk, uh, she's going to be talking about questions, a window into uh, children's minds. Um, so uh, she says, knowing your students is a key to uh, uh, designing effective learning experiences. And uh, today's talk will reflect on how well do we really know our students and her journey through one of her uh, experiments to uh, say uh, to work with children uh, on a multilingual online repository repository of questions as best school students, which is called Savali Ram. She's going to talk a lot about that. Uh, I heard her first talk about Savali Ram, I think uh, pre-COVID days, and it was a very exciting time for me to understand how uh, she works in these topics which uh, seem uh, which are very relevant but uh, which are somewhat invisible to most of us too right so i'd like to uh, say a few lines from her uh, 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 from her journey that she has uh, documented in leelavati's daughters uh, she says the following uh, uh, this is like the last part of her uh, of her essay uh, it's a four page essay it's a very nicely written essay she says uh, about how uh, she feels what she should have done differently uh, from uh, what, how her journey went. So the last sentence in her essay says, I should have been pro proactive in dealing with child labor, a callous practice that still keeps the majority of our girls and boys from achieving their potential. So uh, Professor Ramdas is dedicated to teaching students at the primary and secondary level. We have learned a lot more about the tertiary level education. And today we will hear from Professor uh, Brahmdas on how it is to work with children much younger and you know get their potential going. Yeah. So thank you so much, Professor Ramdas, uh, for uh, being with us today, accepting our invitation. And uh, despite the power cuts, you are like you have <laughs> you have joined us and giving this talk so we are very grateful to you so the stage is yours professor yeah very we are de very delighted to have you today. thank you thank you so much jaya for that 
very kind in, uh, introduction and thank you for inviting me to give this talk. It's really a pleasure for me uh, to talk with you about uh, a subject which is very close to my heart and uh, a project uh, which is meant to be one that is uh, participative, uh, which will involve many people, already does, and I hope it will more and more. And uh, I, I have something specifically to say um, uh, to teachers as well as to uh, institutions like uh, IIIT on how uh, we could kind of put our resources and our uh, you know, ideas together in the interests of uh, children's education in the country. So uh, to begin with the talk, uh, you know, this talk is about questions. Children's questions uh, play a very central role in the teaching learning process. And uh, I will first try to um, see what is the place of questions in uh, children's understanding. And then I will talk, uh, like Jaya said, about the Sawaliram platform and uh, the questions repository that we are building up there and what that is telling us, what that is revealing about uh, uh, children's questions. It is, in fact, there are many paradoxes here, uh, but let's just focus on one paradox. And to state the paradox clearly, uh, we must begin with some facts. So first is, uh, uh, we must remember that curiosity is instinctive. Uh, it's not something which you have to, which you need to, you know, introduce or teach or anything. It's, it's just there in uh, almost every living animal. It goes back, uh, roots go back into evolution, maybe a few hundred thousand, hundred million years ago. And they go back to the, our development in our childhood. So it's a natural characteristic of childhood. You know, every child asks questions. And uh, these questions are extremely important as a means of molding the cognitive development of the child. So questions are the way in which children find out about the world around them. That is how they know uh, about things which are beyond their immediate experience. So the only way to find out for a little child is to ask the nearest adult uh, uh, around them. Now, from childhood, you know, uh, if you go into the social sphere, then questioning is essential. It, uh, you know, in everyday human interactions, we ask questions. So you meet somebody, you ask them, how are you? Uh, you know, ask about the family. I, it is a way for us humans to interact with each other, to find out about each other. And uh, uh, it is a way also in which we structure a society. So the way in which social interactions happen. And, um, uh, uh, you know, the healthy functioning of our society requires that we ask questions. Now, uh, so this is, you know, in general, uh, uh, what I'm trying to say is that it's instinctive, questioning is instinctive. Questioning is actually characteristic of, although curiosity uh, goes, uh, you know, extends to um, other animals, but questioning is something which is very characteristic of uh, humans. Uh, and uh, if you come to learning, be for children's learning. So, uh, you know, at this point, I would like you all to use the chat box because it is very hard to, uh, you know, speak uh, just uh, without knowing if I'm kind of getting through. Uh, and I, I'm even talking about, you know, getting feedback from children about what they are thinking. So I would really like to know what you people are thinking. And I would like you to please please type your questions in the chat box. So as we go along, we can see, uh, you know, where we are going at. So you can ask any questions about questions, particularly in relation to uh, school or college education or even beyond. So any questions, I'd really appreciate if uh, 
any of you type your questions in the chat box. Please feel free. We can, I see the remark here that questions will be taken at the end of the talk, which is fine. So let's see the context um, and the context of education, school education. And I'm saying as we knew it, because it has changed immensely in the past year and a half with the pandemic. So generally our idea of uh, school education was that uh, there's a school, the children come there, teachers and children interact. And uh, you know there is some reading and writing, uh, maybe teacher writes on the blackboard, children copy or teacher speaks and children respond. There might be tests, exams. So there was a certain process and a certain uh, structure to things, to uh, the happenings in the school as we knew it. And this whole process, because of the pandemic, it has got completely upended. And what has been the consequence of that? And uh, so we look into the consequence and we, uh, you know, many people have tried to see what uh, has been happening to school education in the past uh, year and a half. And what has happened has been a consequence of the school system as it was, as it has been for decades and even centuries uh, before the pandemic. So we have a highly stratified school system. It is one of the most stratified school systems in the entire world. And it reflects the divisions in society. So we have a you know, huge contrast from elite and mostly urban schools, uh, which are very well endowed to remote schools where perhaps teachers uh, often in most parts of the year, teachers cannot even reach the schools. So there is a huge uh, divide. And in fact, there are a number of divisions. There is a you know, whole spectrum of schools that we have in uh, our society. And between the top and the bottom, there are extreme inequalities in the quality of input and also in the achievement of students. This is well known. What uh, we must realize is that in the past year and a half, this exclusion has got intensified. It has got hugely in intensified the divide which was always there, this contrast which was always there has got magnified and it has got sharpened and to a very worrying extent that uh, it is going to have repercussions. Uh, right now, you know, things may look normal. We might think that, okay, schools are going to open up and, uh, you know, things will go back to normal. But uh, educationists have been warning us and we must listen to them. So there have been several reports which have uh, been brought out on uh, uh, what has been happening to school education. There are, uh, have been surveys by a number of agencies, uh, institutes, government, non-government organizations. And uh, uh, this is one of the recent uh, surveys which was published it is called the School Children's Online and Offline Learning or School Survey. It was published recently, a couple of months ago. And it has focused on the other side of this divide, uh, which is children from underprivileged households uh, in 15 states and union territories of India. And I'll cite just two of the uh, results from here. One is that, you know, we, we all know that uh, there have been problems with online education, uh, you know, due to connectivity, access to devices, uh, uh, you know, other economic hardships that people have been through. But apart from the online education, the even the offline education has uh, suffered, of course, because there is uh, no contact between teachers and students. And, uh, you know, one of the results of this survey, uh, they found that the study time, the amount of time uh, children spent in learning was just, uh, uh, sorry, the first point is about online education. So online study is just 24% uh, in urban areas and 8% in rural areas. 
and the offline time has also declined literacy has declined and you know once we lose uh, literacy at this very um, it's easy, very easy to lapse into illiteracy at a very young age and recovery is difficult because of the social forces you know if children do not learn to read and write at a certain age uh, it is very hard for them to uh, catch up afterwards and they need to have that continuous exposure to you know books and reading and uh, talking about books discussing with uh, in the classroom you know hearing these things just said so having lost that it is a huge uh, loss and the literacy performance that uh, has been found 42% not able to read even a single word is worse than found in any previous survey and uh, a, a long term impacts are, are, are going to happen you know we it, things look normal but uh, things are really not normal we have seen children return to child labor child marriage there are psychological effects uh, which are there on children uh, which are different in urban and rural areas or even nutritional uh, effects you know in uh, better off families maybe children have become overweight but uh, in children who were dependent on midday meals there are nutritional uh, you know they are undernourished and the reason i'm talking about this is that any initiative we have in education must take account of this calamity and these are huge problems they need very large scale policy intervention and we should all really be thinking what are these policy interventions that are required in this uh, current situation but here are in this talk of course i'm going to talk about a very limited project but what i'm saying is that just bringing these factors into our conversation is important and at least the least it does is we can check if the direction in which we are moving is the right one so any individual effort may not amount uh, to addressing these huge problems but at least we must make sure that we are doing it in the right way you know we have that perspective in mind so here now i'm trying to focus on the topic of this talk that what is it that uh, Uh, what are the issues that we have to address the first issue is of inclusivity that the system has been exclusive it has now become the digital divide has increased the exclusivity of the system how do we bring back inclusivity into this system the children who were in school and uh, you know interacting with teachers are not there anymore how do we bring their voices into our discourse and how do we make it a two way discourse because our communication in classrooms had always been somewhat two unidirectional uh, but now it is even more so you know distance education has made it even more uh, one way so we need to bring back this two way discourse into our communication bring closeness into remote education and let the viewpoints of children shape our educational transactions we cannot afford to decide without reference to the children what we are going to teach and then go ahead and teach it because we need to know the children's perspective to uh, to teach them anything meaningfully so i'd like you to keep these questions in mind and particularly the point about inclusivity and the two way discourse so they i will try to show how we are trying to address uh, these two issues through savali ram so let's break down this idea of a two way discourse and make it a little more specific so we want to know what are students interested in what are students from different backgrounds you know what are the students own interests what do they want to learn what are they already motivated to learn and uh, what is their own perspective of looking at things what are their doubts and their misunderstandings and can we address these doubts and misunderstandings while teaching any topic so this is where the students questions come in because we find out about children's interests about 
what they want to learn about what they don't understand and what they understand you know all of this is revealed through their questions so now about savali ram savali ram is a character created in the hoshangabad science teaching program hoshangabad is a district in madhya pradesh and the program was run by uh, what was then kishor bharti and uh, later there was an institute called eklavya that was uh, formed in uh, hoshangabad and currently exists in uh, bhopal madhya pradesh and uh, the teaching program uh, was an inquiry based uh, teaching program and uh, there was an issue that the children were learning through experiments and inquiry and not through giving up information so it was it was quite uh, you know a, a very new idea in the 1970s uh, it has now become much more accepted in mainstream education the idea of inquiry uh, based learning in this program savali ram was a character who was created and children would write in those days it was postcards they would send uh, postcards to savali ram and uh, there was a group of people you know in fact Uh, several scientists were involved uh, scientists college uh, faculty uh, educators were involved in responding to the questions of all these children and several thousand questions came in uh, in this savali ram program today and uh, this pro program ran you know it, it is in fact still running and, and these question answers are being published in uh, journals in hindi which are run by eklavya so today we are talking about an online version of savali ram so the website is savaliram.org it is an online repository of questions answers articles written by teachers and resources for teaching and learning so it's a repository of questions and i will show you the questions some of the questions as we go along and it's a platform to collaborate on answering questions on writing on translating answers it is an open source platform it allows access to data and an analytics and to do your own analytics and i'll tell you details about all of these so writing articles is something that i mentioned and these are some of the articles which have been written by teachers about their experiences of developing curiosity or handling questions uh, from children and this is where we'd like to reach out to more teachers who are trying new things in their classroom to share their experiences on on this platform this is a quote from one of the teachers and it goes back to the first uh, paradox that i mentioned the paradox of questions and this teacher can feel it in her own life so she says how can an educator inspire questions i don't mean the regular do i write this in my notebook or when do i have to submit this but questions which come when a child engages with something that sparks her curiosity the ones that bubble right up reflecting the wonder in a child's mind these are rare and teachers often realize this that getting children to you know freely express themselves and ask their questions can sometimes be a challenge and in the whole uh, way that the classroom functions uh it becomes even more of the uh, even more of a challenge uh but yet this teacher goes on so in fact this was uh, written in 2021 and in this school uh they tried something so they tried using videos uh in the online mode um, to uh, to inspire curiosity in children and the videos were selected very nicely which got the children to think and to raise questions and you can hear uh, you can uh, read these experiences on savali ram so we'll go further okay so now right now i'm going through the public part of the website so you can read the articles on the website you can search the questions at present there are some 4000 plus questions and uh, you can search uh, you can filter uh, see the answers to the questions you can filter by subject by state uh, by curriculum and you can see some of the metadata that which has been entered along with the questions if you have any questions at this point you know please uh, do ask we mentioned inclusivity and how do you get inclusivity in a system by 
making sure that there is uh, we are reaching diverse populations of uh, students and that is what we are trying to do so of these we have uh, questions in seven languages see uh, children asking questions in their own language is extremely important because uh, you know we are most free in our own languages and in fact uh, you know i can compare the same question asked by a child in english and the same question asked in their uh, native language and children express themselves much better uh, in their own language and of course they understand uh, their own language much better and uh, this is even true of children studying in the english medium so at present we have seven languages although you know to be honest we have most of the questions are in three of the languages uh, kannada is not one of the languages and i hope uh, we will soon have many more languages uh, than just these seven because we speak many languages in our country the answers are there uh, only in three languages uh, we have hindi Uh, hindi because a large number of questions come from madhya pradesh from the hoshangabad science teaching program and we have marathi and we have english 15 states of india are represented so you can see all of this actually in savaliram uh, analytics i will show you some of the pages from there we have at present questions collected over 40 years and they go right from 1971 to date they're from rural and urban areas they're from government and private schools not all equally represented but at least we have made a start in introducing a diversity into the data yeah so all this was the public facing part of the website till now uh, this is the dashboard so you can create a login id at the dashboard and uh, with the login id you can submit questions at present we have the system of uh, filling out an excel template because we need the questions and the metadata and this is best done by um, a teacher or somebody who is in contact with the children collect the questions and submit it along with some simple uh, metadata you can uh, answer the questions so if you have permission and if you have the credentials to answer questions you can answer questions in multiple languages uh, you can uh, write articles and share your experiences you can translate content and um, uh, the questions the answers or the metadata or any content you can translate it into multiple languages this is a screenshot from the website just to give an idea majority of the questions are asked in hindi and then we have english and marathi and uh, very low representation from other languages and you can look at uh, you know there are these selectors on the side so you can go through the analytics i'm just giving this as a, just to illustrate the kind of analytics that we have yeah here is a comparison between the subjects in which children ask questions and a comparison between girls and boys so the red bars two red bars are for biology this is questions in stem subjects and the majority of the questions are in stem subjects the non stem questions are fewer uh, for uh, see all of this is uh, i would say an artifact of the way in which the data is collected because most of the data has been collected in the course of either a science talk given to kids or uh, a science class or a, a science a science teaching project like the hoshangabad project i mentioned so obviously the questions were more focused on science so you see the maximum number of questions are from biology for both girls and boys equally next comes physics and then uh, chemistry there is a significant number of questions about science so you know things like who invented something or how did something develop how do we know things so which are categorized under history philosophy and practice of science and earth and environment there is a significant uh, number of questions that children ask but you see the pattern is very similar for girls and boys so this data you can go to the analytics page in the savaliram.org website and uh, you can see more analytics there and you can also try uh, your own visualization ideas in this uh, 
Tableau Public, which is a third party website, which allows for making of visualizations of different kinds. And you can contact us if you're interested in analyzing the data. So this idea of open access, uh, you know, a website which is collectively built through contribution of educators and uh, subject experts and uh, uh, an open access to that data to the public or to researchers who may want to understand that data. Uh, so this is something which in the sciences is very uh, well accepted the idea of open access uh, databases. In education, we don't as, as yet have, uh, it is not such a common thing to have an open access database. And we are hoping that Sawaliram would be one. And even now, it, uh, uh, you know, if you go to Tableau Public, you can uh, download the data. Or of course, you can write to us, anybody who's interested in the data can write to us. And, uh, so, of course, there are certain fields uh, that we collect, like uh, the name of the child who asked the question, the name of the school, or the name of the um, person who submitted the question. So all of these, or even the name of the school, these are all private fields, and uh, they would not be you know, openly accessible. But uh, other metadata, like was it a girl or a boy, urban or rural, from which area, from which state, uh, which studying in which class and so on. So this kind of metadata is uh, accessible freely. Okay, so uh, now let us go into further specifics and ask what are the children asking? What do they want to know? Uh, what are these? I showed a few questions in the beginning. Here are some more examples of questions that children have asked. And you see there are different kinds of questions, different subject areas. But one thing common about them is that most of the questions are based on everyday experiences. And um, they may have something to do with the curricular content, uh, but finding that uh, connection is not always uh, straightforward. However, if you make the attempt to find the connection, it would be certainly very rewarding in the teaching of those subjects in school. And of course, it, it is a way to relate uh, our teaching with students' experiences, which has would have multiple downstream effects. So this is a somewhat uh, simple-minded uh, analysis. I, I mean, it's a kind of informal look into the data by looking at the word uh, cloud. And this is the raw data, and this is done on a, a commercial website, but we are uh, uh, on a free free website, wordcloud.com. But uh, we hope to develop a open source repository of code to uh, do such analysis, uh, do text analysis, uh, basically. So I'll give you a few seconds to look at the word crowd. And uh, then let's take some of these words, which is a screenshot of the CSV file. So you see which are the most commonly occurring words. And since it is a raw data file, you know, there are words here which could have been avoided, but uh, let them be for now. So the top uh, word is water. Then you have can, and then you have made. So made is an interesting verb, and uh, we'll see what, what it means. Then you have get and earth and people. So let's look at the kind of questions. I'll select three of these. I've selected water and made and people. And let's see what are the uh, students' questions in these. So water. We saw that there were 307 instances in the database. And uh, these are from 260 questions. And what are these questions? Majority of them are connected with biology. So about various animals, how do fish, what do fish eat in water? How do they breathe? There are questions which are, which relate to some superstitions or some 
sayings which are there. What quality in a swan enables it to drink milk while filtering out the water? And the child is very puzzled about it. You know, how can such a, how is such a thing even possible? Right, rightly so. This is a more recent one. Can a coronavirus survive in water? In fact, it's, uh, this was from the beginning of the pandemic. This was in March uh, last year that a child in primary school asked this question, can a coronavirus survive in water? Then there's questions on physical properties of water. Even though both are colorless, how come we can see water, but we can't see air? So you see, all of these are based on some experiences of children. They are based on quite keen observation and they are very clearly stated also. So many of these questions have come in in a written form. Children have given them in written form. So continuing with water, these are some questions on chemical properties of water. And you see, when we are teaching these subjects, biology, physics, chemistry in school, it would it's nice if we know what uh, children are asking. So we can address these uh, in our teaching. And this is, so now I'm showing you from the entire database, but this is something which a teacher can do in their own classroom. Why can't vehicles run on water? What is there in diesel that drives a truck and motor? And you will find an answer to this in uh, Savalira. Why is water wet? Water and the environment, like I said, the, on the earth and environment category, there is a good number of questions. How was water formed in nature? Why do clouds appear black, even though water is colorless? Why are trees so important? Can you really bring water to a dry area by growing trees? Children are concerned about these things. So the next word we've taken is made. So in fact, uh, children ask uh, this, you know, who made everything? Where did, where did things come from? Uh, this is a very common question. And the type of things that children have asked about, some of them are listed here. So they can, uh, you know, range from candles to atom bombs, natural things, artificial uh, human made uh, objects or even muscles teeth you know children wonder how how are these things made or it could be natural phenomena like the moon and the rainbow and the third word i've taken is people so these are questions children have asked about people it gives you a glimpse into how they are thinking why do people get tired after work Again, superstitions, people say that the clouds eat the leaves of the acacia tree. Is it true? This question was asked in Hindi. Why are people poor and why don't they get respect? Very natural question to occur to a child once you think about it. So uh, the, this is one set of questions on COVID uh, that were asked on 13th of March, 2020 from a primary school in Chennai. This was before the schools shut down. So it was clear that there was a pandemic and uh, the teacher chose to have a discussion with the children and tell them a little bit about what was happening uh, with COVID because children were confused. I mean, this is uh, little kids and uh, uh, the science teacher thought that I should discuss this with children. And then she collected, uh, she asked them to ask what were their doubts. And these are the doubts that children came up with. And you see, even at that very early stage, when uh, you know people did not know what was going on and people were very less informed, uh, the kind of ideas that came from children are quite amazing. So they're wondering, how did it come from animals to human beings? How does the coronavirus start living? If you say that the virus is not living, how does it start living? How does it have babies? Can a virus go through the ocean? So at that time, the number of cases in India was not very high. Uh, it was uh, more in some other countries and they were wondering if it will, particularly people had heard about Dubai. So does it cross the ocean? Do air conditioned rooms make it easy for the virus to spread? Why has COVID-19 not so much spread in Africa? And we still don't know the answer to this. Is COVID-19 growing in Europe and North America because it is cold there? So, uh, you know, we 
sometimes are not aware of how much children are listening to adult talk and how much they are forming their ideas on their own and uh, it is only through their questions that we come to know what they are uh, thinking now the next slide we was more than a year later so this was with older children uh, in a different uh, school and uh, it was 14 months later and by that time the second wave had come we were towards the end of that or rather maybe in the middle of the second second wave and uh, the children knew a lot more about covid so questions like what makes it affect the lungs and not any other organ can a person contract covid twice if we have been affected by covid and typhoid you know all sorts of ideas were going around at that time can we eat non vegetarian food um covid and black fungus they were worried that you know is the vaccine even working we have heard of people with two doses of vaccine dying of covid 19 why is the vaccine not working then this was in hyderabad where this n440 strain was uh, uh, had been just discovered so they had been clearly reading in the newspapers or hearing about it and they're worried about it how many waves are we going to have during covid 19 so like again this is to show that uh, like for me it was quite a surprise that children were were so well informed a and uh, had uh, really formulated ideas for themselves and had their own questions and certainly we need to know what uh, what these ideas that children have formulated are so to summarize when we look through this window of children's questions we get to understand them and uh, this can happen at two different levels so first is in the classroom a teacher in the classroom can learn something from the questions that children ask and uh, so I, but uh, you know there is a problem that teachers have is that children ask a lot of questions to which they don't know the answers so one of the uh, purposes of the savaliram website is to make accessible uh, credit credible answers to uh, questions of children and also to enable the uh, teacher to submit their teacher their uh, students questions to uh, savaliram so uh, you know sooner or later this questions would be answered and it is a big boost for the children to know that their question has been answered by some expert and to and you know to find the answer there online so that is at the individual uh, teacher level the second level is at uh, the level of the bigger uh, data repository and here we are looking uh, you know i showed you some of the metadata analysis and a little bit uh, the uh, you know a beginning with uh, getting an idea about the word cloud but we are hoping to do more serious uh, text analysis via this open source repository and uh, uh, using also tableau public but uh, with more emphasis on having an open source code base which can be used for text analysis can you try to click on this if i think you can go to the github this is a code base of savaliram and uh, so it's savaliram/savaliram and uh, so at present in the savaliram project there is only one repository uh, we're planning to have another repository for text analysis where we can take the text of the questions and use natural language processing in python to uh, analyze it uh, the questions and uh, you can go to the next link also just go down the page and click on the savaliram analytics 2 okay the one has uh, only the map and the other one uh, just go back so you can see how many yeah you can click here to start the journey so 
This is done by a data analyst in Bangalore, again a volunteer. And uh, you know, this is all responsive visualizations, which uh, uh, so this it's this is possible for anybody to do. You know, they can get the data and make their own visualizations. Yeah, you can go to the next page just for illustration, just to show what kind of visualizations are made. So here at present, uh, uh, so the second uh, one is the same as the first. Uh, yeah, so I think that's that's fine. That's fine. So uh, so that is our next idea to do some text analysis, and uh, you know we invite volunteer contributions to this open source repository. If you're interested, please get in touch. Yeah, so I'll stop here, and just to say that this website is built through the contribution of many people, teachers, developers researchers, subject experts, and would you like to contribute to the website? We'd be very happy if you do. And uh, we also, we're looking uh, also for developed people who will help in the development, who could perhaps be student interns uh, with Eklavya. And we have had such interns in the past who have contributed to the development. Um, so if you know somebody who would like to have a brief assignment to do uh, development for Savadiram, please uh, get in touch. Okay, thank you. I will stop here and let's look at the questions. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I think you can see the questions in the chat box. Yeah. By Shilpi, she's saying, in a classroom, majority of the questions are of managerial kind, which focuses on have you completed the homework? Have you understood, etc.? Are the answers of which are mostly in uh, yes or no? That's yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a very good observation. And in fact, that is what uh, uh, the quote from the teacher, which I showed, I also said exactly this. And the challenge for the teachers is how to get children to ask meaningful questions. And the point is that it is not that difficult. It might uh, seem difficult because maybe it has not happened before, but it is only a matter of removing some inhibitions, right. and uh, which can be done in several ways. So for example, we found that just asking children to write their questions on a slip of paper and give it anonymously is enormously releasing you know it it uh, children become much freer that way right. standing up in class and asking a question is uh, is uh, you know you feel vulnerable somebody might laugh at you and and kids do laugh and uh, or the teacher may scold you or something but if it's an anonymous question it that's a much safer uh, space and there are ways uh, like uh, in some schools we've had teachers having uh, um, bulletin boards where the children can post their questions. So they, the question is publicly visible, but um, uh, you don't, I mean, the child is not put on a spot. They, you know, they can just put the question there and uh, you know, other people can look at it. And then there can be a discussion. So, so there are ways of doing it and uh, we just have tried this. So the backers question is, uh, does curiosity decrease with child's age? Yeah, yeah. So this is a, a very common observation. And in fact, if you actually look at the data, you find that uh, children below the age of five years ask uh, lots of questions. You know, maybe it's around 10,000 questions in a year. Uh, or uh, even in one hour, children can ask about 20, 25 questions easily. Uh, but the same children, when they go to kindergarten and further as they progress through the school, uh, you do find uh, that questions are less. But uh, is curiosity less is the question. You know, the expression of curiosity is less, but curiosity itself uh, can manifest in many ways. And curiosity can also manifest through exploration, uh, which certainly one finds in uh, uh, younger children. And uh, uh, the questions can be expressed by creating uh, conducive conditions. 
so at least in childhood certainly question I, 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 the type of curiosity may be different like people have studied curiosity in adolescence and uh, there is certainly adolescents have a lot of curiosity about many things and uh, yeah, but it's a different kind of curiosity uh, sometimes it can go into dangerous explorations uh, you know the curiosity of adolescents uh, even at an older age uh, i mean you find how much time uh, uh, see what are these uh, clickbaits what they take advantage of the human tendency to be curious uh, so uh, you know you can see the curiosity expressed in many different ways even in adulthood uh, and uh, so it is a matter of kind of constructively channeling the curiosity at every age first of all helping it to get expressed and then channeling it constructively. Yes, Professor. Uh, so the next question is something that I asked. So questioning is a communication skill even though it is natural to form questions. Should this be taught deliberately? Uh, wouldn't that help? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It is a communication skill, and not only that, the practice of uh, framing questions is something which um, helps you to understand what you have not understood. You know, so sometimes uh, um, some of the teachers whom we know have made it a practice for the children to frame exam questions. So instead of the teacher framing the question, the child uh, frames the question. And in order to frame the question, you know, you have to know, you have some idea of what the answer should be. So it's a very good way of studying also to, uh, 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 to frame an exam paper of your own. And uh, so definitely it is, a, uh, it is a skill. It is a communication skill and it is a um, skill which helps you to comprehend uh, also. And uh, yeah, and definitely it can be taught deliberately. So, you know, it need not even be taught in a very uh, didactic way. Uh, just the practice of doing it is good enough. Just the opportunity to do it, spaces to do it in, and the practice of doing it is, is good enough. Right, I guess the more you do, you get better at it. Right? Yeah, yeah, like uh, many things. <laughs> Uh, the next question is by Dibakar. I think these were the slides you were talking about COVID-19. Yeah. So, on policy, uh, implementation is a huge challenge. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, you know, uh, of course, implementation is a challenge, but uh, we need also some clarity about what we should be doing. So, for example, when we go back, schools reopen, can we, uh, you know, say a child who was in the third standard, has missed, uh, you know, one of the one year has gone outside of school, has not even attended class three classes, and is now in the fifth standard. So, can we expect, uh, uh, you know, the class five teaching to go on as expected? Uh, and clearly, the answer is no. So, what can we do at a systemic level uh, to? deal with these challenges and of course each uh, uh, each teacher has to find their own solutions but there has to be this is you know the education system has to guide them so there have to be certain policies uh, to know you know which is the direction in which to go beyond that yes of course implementation is a problem but i think the first thing is clarity in our minds accepting the problem i think that's the first thing accepting that there is a problem because, uh, you know, most people tend to kind of uh, see because of this contrast that, uh, you know, uh, children of educated parents have, in fact, uh, some might have gained, you know, just for the freedom that they got uh, without school and with the parents having, uh, being at home and the parents being able to guide them and uh, they could explore on the internet and follow their own interests. And uh, so uh, children might even have gained from it. And uh, 
certainly the loss is less if the resources uh, children have had access to uh, resources. Uh, so uh, it is very easy for us to forget that this is not the majority. And uh, so there is a policy uh, change which is needed. There, is, there are policy directives which need to be uh, there. So uh, that the problem is, you know, so that we accept the problem. At least on paper, we accept that there is a problem. And then, you know, we can look for the implementation. And the implementation has to be done. You have to take teachers into confidence. You have to, uh, yeah, it, it is a challenge, but it needs to be done, yeah. Right. So the next question is again from me. So how can questioning be made more practical or feasible in large classes? Uh, wouldn't skewed uh, student-teacher ratios be a problem here? I think you had answered it saying that uh, Savari Ram itself is a collaborative platform, so all teachers can sort of participate and help. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So making, but you're right that making this space for questions uh, is, uh, you know, already there are, there is so much happening in the classroom. And uh, so where is the uh, space? Uh, but uh, if it is done uh, systematically, uh, you know, you, you can carve out that uh, space. You know, uh, we spend a lot of time in revision, for example, you know, some of that time could be given uh, to asking questions. And also a lot of it could go outside the classroom. So you can ask children to, uh, you can have a question box in which uh, children put their questions. And, you know, the teacher need not answer all the questions. Even if you answer, you know, two questions out of uh, all uh, the whole question box, that motivates children to keep asking, you know, to once they have a hope that some questions are going to be answered. And of course, there's Savali Ram always where you can uh, submit the questions. Right. Uh, so Shilpi's question is, children in rural area may not have access to this platform due to internet or bandwidth issues. Wouldn't uh, inclusivity be uh, affected because of this? Yeah, yeah, that's an excellent observation. And uh, certainly any online intervention has uh, uh, this issue. Uh, so uh, uh, the point here is that uh, online intervention uh, is a one-way uh, 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 kind of interaction. Uh, to build the two-way discourse into it, so here in Savali Ram, even though it is, uh, you know, accessing it uh, uh, is a one-way uh, uh, part, but if the children's voices are already in it, that is one step uh, ahead. And uh, the submission of the question we have asked, so if you see the internet access between students and teachers, teachers have much better access to the internet. And uh, uh, here the main responsibility is really on teachers or on adults. It could be parents, it could be others who work with children to be that link between the online platform and uh, the child. Because yes, uh, that's right. You cannot expect every child to access Savali Ram. Uh, actually, there are a few questions streaming in from the YouTube live stream also. So I'll quickly finish these. So the next question I had was, uh, has the data and postcards been analyzed at all or, uh, as well? Or for 40 years of Savali Ram, you would have wealth of information. So whatever data was accessible and uh, available mm -hmm. has been input into Savali Ram. Okay. So of the 4,000 questions that you saw, about almost 2,000 of them are from uh, the uh, database. And some, uh, you know, about 1,000 odd are from um, the 1970s from the Homi Bhava Center. So that, uh, uh, so yeah, there is a wealth of information, certainly. Yeah, that's interesting. So um, the next question is, uh, and I, you can actually go to the analytics page and see how the data are distributed over the years. Yeah, uh, uh, could you show the analytics page? Yeah, yeah. Sure, Professor. 
So meanwhile, I'll read the next question. Uh, that's again related to the anal uh, analysis part. So Shilpi has asked, analysis uh, of- uh, Sorry, uh, this is not the page. Go to savaliram.org. Shilpi had asked, uh, analysis of this data may help to catch common misconceptions across different topics and then use this information to design the pedagogy and assessment in classroom. Yes, definitely. Definitely, totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. The students frame questions shows their understanding as well as their misunderstandings of them. Okay, if you go, just go down the page. So you can do a search here with the view. And if you go further down, just go further down. Yeah, there's the view analytics. And you can click on those. So this is question language, year of asking question. So this is how the 40 year old, uh, 40 year data is distributed at present. Right, that's quite impressive. I, I guess, yeah, there were questions even before the internet's uh, way of asking questions also, right? So, so yeah, this is nice. Um, so the next question we have here is uh, learning and teaching form a cycle. Today's learners are tomorrow's teachers. In this case, if our education system has not encouraged questioning, are the teachers equipped to answer these questions? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. And uh, in fact, uh, if the teachers themselves have not asked questions, uh, you know, first it, the, the teachers have to get a feel for what it is to ask questions. And then of course, answering them comes uh, next. Uh, but so, so the idea of Sabaliram is also that uh, it's a advocacy platform an advocacy for uh, questioning. And uh, it is a tool uh, for answering questions. So, uh, you know, once you upload the questions, then people can access them and use the dashboard to answer the question. So the teacher does not have to answer each and every question. And in fact, uh, uh, it should help the teacher feel comfortable that I'm not supposed to know everything. You know, nobody knows everything. Not even uh, the expert who is answering the question will have to look up a few books and then answer it. Uh, it's, uh, so that is something which we need to get comfortable with. We need to get comfortable with the idea that we don't know everything. And in fact, we know very little. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I, I, but as long as you're willing to look for answers, uh, in one way or another, that, that, that is the point. I mean, the point is to have the attitude towards questioning and the attitude towards exploration to find the answers. Right, right. I guess this questioning system is very different from just typing a Google search uh, question and you know getting just one short answer and wading through all that information. This is like yeah. a learning, uh, more intense learning process, right? So. Uh, I, I, yeah, and it is more... Uh, kind of um, uh, tailored towards questions which Indian children ask. You know, it's uh, so, uh, yeah, at, in, uh, when you look at, and in Google, the question could be answered at many different levels or that particular question may not be addressed at all. But, um, I, I, you know, another part of the Savaliram website is also there is a resources page in which, which links to other websites which uh, are you know Q and A type of websites, and there are some good ones, definitely. So, Pras uh, Professor Prasanna has asked, "Is this integrated with NPTEL at some level?" Uh, no, at present, no. Yeah. But uh, uh, if you can suggest some ways to do it, I mean, always uh, it's always a good idea to kind of. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, you know, talk. But yeah, I, I guess NPTEL is more for technical education, but I think, you know, having platforms like this itself is no, like. NPTEL, so this uh, for, uh, would be uh, useful for teacher education. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, right, yeah. Right. 
So um, there's a question from YouTube Live by Vaishnavi Ramesh, who's an uh, alumna. Uh, she says, she says, good afternoon, Professor. Thank you for an enlightening session. How do we guide children to figuring out answers to their questions in a self-directed manner? How can parents and teachers support children on their journey of inquiry? I emphasize parents in this question because in the past 20 months, parents have suddenly found themselves to be co-teachers in their kids' uh, educational journey and often parents require guidance. Yeah, that's a very good question. And uh, it is, uh, it's not only parents, but also uh, teachers need to be on this uh, journey. Uh, that, um, you know, ultimately we don't want a situation of uh, children always posing questions and expecting a ready-made uh, answer. Uh, but uh, children going through this process of exploration on their own, supported by either teachers or parents, and that is, um, so if you look at the article space, I, I showed you some of the articles which are there on the website. So teachers have shared their experiences of doing this. So please uh, do look at it. And uh, these are teachers actually struggling with this situation in which uh, kids have asked questions and they are looking at how to guide the children to find the answers or how to deal with those questions in the classroom. So please do look at that. Uh, there's a comment uh, in YouTube live. Uh, greetings from Indonesia. Thank you for this enlightening session. Oh, wow. Thank you for joining. So I think we can leave the floor open if anybody wants to ask questions. I think we have exhausted the ones on the, in the chat box. Um, I guess one of the curious things for people at RipleITB would be like, um, can we use artificial intelligence to answer some of the questions, right? Uh, to at least lessen the burden from, for the teachers, right? So is that a possibility? I mean, again, it's not guaranteed that the answers are right, but... I mean. Well, we, we could certainly try. And uh, so all the answers go through a review process, uh, but certainly since the questions are available uh, online, you know, they could be used as an input for uh, uh, an AI program. Yeah, definitely. And you're most welcome uh, if you're interested in doing this. Yeah, we have some AI experts here, so <laughs> they can they can be motivated to work yeah. on this. Great, that would be really interesting. So yeah, I, I'll leave the floor open if anybody wants to ask questions. It's a small crowd anyway, so if you would like to ask questions, please feel free to unmute and ask. Um, so, uh, you know, please uh, do get in touch. And I, you have to, uh, you know, email IDs for Chawali Ram, or you could also write to me personally. So how do you engage uh, school students into it? Anybody can create an account or do you go through anybody school? Anybody can create an account. Yeah, anybody can create an account. Wow. Uh, so do schools uh, sort of enroll um, and then the, with provision for students so, to uh, answer. Is this I don't think there is any kind of a well set uh, system like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, interested teachers have created accounts and they have submitted questions. Right. right. So uh, for now, when uh, people. But I would uh, uh, say if uh, you're really interested in doing this, it's um better if you write uh, to me first write to Savali Ram and you know share because it is after all see once the questions are submitted to the database then uh, you know correcting uh, even spelling errors or you know problems with the metadata or some wrong characters and so on get can get to be an issue uh, so both for questions and answers we usually you know sort of personally advise the people to, uh, you know, just check the data beforehand, get it confirmed, or even sometimes uh, a reviewing. So we have a review system for answers mm -hmm. and you can create an account for Savali Ram and have review uh, permission and you can review. Uh, but the dialogue that needs to happen for, uh, you know, getting an answer into final polished form, 
sometimes can be too tedious to do over the platform. So it's better if it is done, you know, one on one, and the questions are already reviewed, and then before, uh, so the, sorry, the question set, data sets, as well as answers, as well as translations, in fact. And translations, uh, this is a more uh, uh, a serious issue because only somebody who knows that language, who knows the two languages well, can judge the translations. And so uh, it is very hard to find, you know, such people are few, such people and who are also, you know, competent to uh, know the content and who have the time uh, to do this. And so so the, that's a lot that we're asking. So specifically for translation, certainly it's better if we have, if you find a reviewer for the translation and then do that. Yes. Right, right. So uh, most of these are uh, transactional, right? I mean, there's a question and then there's an answer. Uh, what would you do? I mean, most of the times questioning is like a conversational thing, right? I mean, this is what we are having right now, right? Yeah. So uh, uh, you said something and then I asked the question on that. And so so do you feel like Sawali Ram can support uh, that kind of, you know, set of conversations where so follow-on questions can be? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think that at present is a limitation. So mm -hmm. we um, we tried using uh, the Slack platform and uh, uh, for doing this to have a conversation amongst people who were discussing uh, answers to. Uh, mm -hmm. And we can, uh, it, it didn't quite take off, but if there are sufficient number of people who are uh, interested in the discussion, uh, yeah. then Slack is a good platform. Mm -hmm. and the dialogue can happen over over Slack, and then the final answer can be uploaded on Savaridam. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So that capability is not there in Savaridam at present. It would need you know one more round of development. Right. So uh, this must not be the first. We already have you know we have Slack, we have Discourse. There are open source uh, uh, platforms also. Yeah, which we could, uh, you know, if there is sufficient interest, we could even install this course on the Savali Ram server. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so you had mentioned that uh, students feel more comfortable asking in their local language, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but you also we also see that you know most of the students who have internet access also be English speaking, right? So do you feel that over time, the questions being asked in the local languages or the vernacular languages has, has, has it come down? Uh, 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 no, so the point is that uh, the submission of the question is not by the child themselves. So, oh. the, uh, so the children ask the teacher or uh, another uh, a volunteer or somebody, and then uh, it has to be entered into the Excel template. And then the submission happens. I, 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 so, and uh, every question we ask the volunteers to uh, give an English translation okay. of the question. So if you look on in the search page on the website, mm -hmm. uh, the question is there and it's English. So English is a kind of link language that we're uh, using for that. So definitely the child um, uh, may not have access to the platform on their own, but they have to. So this connected with the previous question somebody asked about uh, digital access. And uh, yeah, for that very reason, we have not uh, required uh, the children to have uh, digital access. Although if they do, it's fantastic. I mean, they, right, right. No, I guess uh, in the uh, last- fact, It could be that, you know, older children, see this is something which is definitely possible in the school uh, since teachers are very busy. Uh, but uh, children in the higher classes who are, say, uh, learning Excel, you know, one of the exercises for them could be to input the questions asked by the younger children, you know, maybe questions collected in a question box. And uh, as a project, the older children could input it into Savali Ram and even try to find the answers, you know, discuss the answers. Okay. Something can happen in the school. So I guess, uh, I mean, there's a saying, right? Uh, it takes a village to uh, 
place of child. So you, uh, I mean, the idea is to literally virtually create that sort of a village. Yeah, yeah. and since this is online, it takes uh, you know, numerous villages to create. <laughs> So um, one of the uh, things uh, I wanted to ask is, in terms of um, say, um, so yeah, so somebody inputs the question uh, that uh, you mentioned, right? So do uh, so then they need to actively the volunteers need to talk to children and then uh, sort of uh, do they filter questions and then put in or sort of like all so the questions? You have to uh, if there are duplicates, uh, uh, you have to remove the duplicates or. If the language, uh, you know, so we uh, don't input it exactly. If there are some grammatical errors or the spelling mistakes and so on, so that we, uh, the volunteers, uh, have to correct it. Or sometimes uh, uh, children ask in a very long-winded way, especially uh, yeah, if they are, if they know that that's one of the problems with uh, asking questions in your own language. That uh, children like to write a lot and uh, or speak a lot so it might be get very convoluted so yeah. the volunteers can you know shorten it uh, to make it to the point so these things this kind of ironing out of the data has to be done by the volunteers and um, yeah and the translation as you said but uh, it, was that your question uh, yeah 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 that was uh, yeah so final thing i wanted to ask is uh, so this has been uh, i mean it, it's been around for 40 years now so it's Oh, the Savaliram platform has been around only for the, it's still developing. Uh, so I guess a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, just before COVID, uh, um, it was really, I mean, the basic platform was completed. Right. And um, I mean, so a lot of the questions which have been input are asked uh, earlier and uh, earlier. in the and, and they have, yeah, they, they have, you know, like uh, Eklavia had these trunks full of postcards. Right. right. And uh, so they just, uh, you know, uh, got them, scanned them, did this OCR. Okay. Uh, like oh, in, that's uh, Digitized them. And so there was a lot of work that went into inputting of the data. Right. Uh, so what I wanted to ask uh, is um, in terms of uh, pedagogy, right? So Say for example, there's a you know the national uh, education policy and all that that has come in, right? So, has any of these been incorporated? Like the learnings from what children asked and what they are curious about, what matters more for them? Uh, has any of this been incorporated in the curriculum as such as of now, or uh, or it is a experiment in, in yeah, progress? NEP is at a very uh, very broad and abstract uh, level. Yeah. Uh, so only when it comes to the curriculum framework and the textbooks, mm -hmm. uh, then these things uh, you can expect. So even in the 2005-06 curriculum, uh, some account had been taken off at that time for students and such to some extent, yes. So hopefully it will be now for the next curriculum that comes. <laughs> Definitely, I think yeah, it it, it should. I mean, uh, such, I mean, such knowledge that has been captured should be used in a more, more fruitful manner. Right? Yeah, yeah. So here the idea is to make it accessible. Exactly. Once the access is there, you know, there is more chances that people will see it and. Definitely. Yeah, so there are a lot of thank you notes there. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, we, we just crossed the 330 limit. So thank you so much, Professor. It has been a wonderful thank you. Uh, it's been conversation of, and a talk. And uh, thank you so much for being with us and uh, giving us this wonderful opportunity. Uh, a big hand of applause for on behalf of everybody who's watching this talk. Uh, so um, with that, we'd like to wind up the session. So I'll hand over the baton back to Amrita. I would like to once again thank Professor Jayashree and Professor Jaya for the extremely enlightening talk and uh, the interactive Q&A session. So with this, we'll close today's Samvad session. The next talk is scheduled on 25th October and will be delivered by Ms. Chaitali and Mr. Prakhar.
the title of the talk is AI based narrative art generation for an engaging learning experience. So looking forward to seeing everyone there. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a nice day.